Hello, my name is Nargis Farzad and I teach Persian at SOAS, University of London. In episode one, I talked about the evolution of Persian language, illustrated by some lovely images. And we stopped at about 7th century AD. In this episode, we're going to look at the Persian language in the Islamic period. I hope you'll enjoy it. I now fast forward to um, the uh, image of the modern borders of Iran. And I always like to remind people that the top section of Iran does look like a Persian cat as well. The era of new or modern Persian starts in the 7th century. Iran or Persia was the only country um, conquered by the Rashidun caliphs um, who did not lose its language to Arabic. And many other of these lands eventually um, lost the use of their native tongue and Arabic became not only the lingua franca but the national language of those regions. Not in Iran. What um, the Persians did they ditched their rather complex, inadequate Middle Persian Pahlavi script gradually and adapted the Arabic script for their needs. And because Persian is an Indo-European language and has various letters that Semitic languages don't have, um, Persian created a script which is now known as the Perso-Arabic script. Iran became an integral part of the Islamic empire and very soon it um, really became the engine that propelled the expansion of the empire further east and um, Persian became the second language of the uh, um, uh, Perso-Islamic uh, empire. Relationship of Arabic and Persian can be compared to the relationship of French and English. You know, there's so many French words in the English language, but they're not grammatically, structurally similar. And same with Persian. We use many Arabic words in Persian, and these are mostly related to the legal, religious, scientific discourse. Uh, Persian soon became the lingua franca of uh, big swathes of this empire, particularly in Central Asia, in the Indian subcontinent, which when it was the official language of the Mughal court. And if we go then today, Persian is the official language of Iran where locally it's known as Farsi. Alongside Pashto, it is one of the two official languages of Afghanistan, again, locally known as Dari. And in Tajikistan, it's the official language of that uh, state and known as Tajik. And you will see, I've given you an example that in Tajikistan, Persian is written in the Cyrillic, i.e. the Russian alphabet. Uh, but in Iran and Afghanistan, it's written in the Perso-Arabic script. Uh, some images of modern publications or a typed text. And here is the children's book. I think you can guess what story. That is Chenel Qirmezi, Little Red Riding Hood. And um, uh, of course, Iranians love their sports and are football mad as any in the region. I now want to introduce you to the language. I normally hate not starting the teaching of Persian with an immediate introduction to the script. But I need to cheat a little bit because I want to squeeze quite a lot in this um, uh, talk. And uh, so I thought it might be easier for you if you have no familiarity 
with the Perso Arabic script to follow what I'm saying if I use the Latin script. But I'm going to give you several clues and I'm going to highlight the familiarities of, say, Persian and English or German. First, I need to give you some just basic information about Persian. Persian has 32 letters of the alphabet. In terms of the characteristic of the language, there is no gender in Persian. There is no he or she, no feminine or masculine. And this makes it much easier to learn compared to languages where you have to work out if it is noun, feminine, masculine, and so on. But it does make the translations of love poetry very interesting. Who is the beloved, female or male? Does it matter? Persian has... Uh, uh, Persian nouns uh, are not subject to any inflection and um, the rules of conjugation are very, very regular. Uh, and uh, the main challenge is learning the script. But even then, you can see that this script has come down from an original source. And again, as soon as you discover the common denominators, and if you twist certain letters that you're already familiar with, you know, turn them clockwise, anti-clockwise, then the mystery diminishes and the learning will become a lot easier. So another characteristic of the Perso Arabic script is that the short vowels are not normally written in. Now, what do I mean with that? So if you have two solid letters, two consonants, let's say in English you have the P and a T. Okay, if you just put them next to each other, well, it's very hard to work out, but what is this word? Is it pat, is it put, pet, pit, pot? What is it? So you do really need those short vowels. And if not just in the shape of vowels, O, A, uh, E, then you need to have some diacritic, some little markers that will enable you to read it. Persian and Arabic do not use these markers. Um, of course you have them when you're starting to learn the script, like you have training wheels when you're learning to ride a bicycle. But before long, these are removed and you might make a few mistakes. Um, but the beauty of Persian is unlike English, where P and T can make so many words, in Persian, they would make maybe maximum of two words. So when you learn them, then you just increase your list of words. You're not going to get muddled up. Another feature of Persian, similar with very many languages, is that the doer of the verb, the um, agent of the verb, the subject comes first, and the verb concludes a sentence. So the order is subject, object, verb. The action comes right at the end and full stop. So if you are ready to take those on board, let's read a little bit of Persian. Now, can you get your eyes used to reading these Latin letters from right to the left. That's the direction of the Persian language, as is Arabic. So the short vowels, all the lowercase letters, will soon be deleted. The solid letters, the consonants are in the capital letter, and the long vowels, like an O, not an A, or an E, not an E, these are written in and are never deleted. And a long O, which is almost you know, verging onto an O, sounds like, I don't know, what word can I say? Like an you know, O as an honor, you know, the long O. So have a go at reading this. I'll give you 10 seconds. Very good. Salam, a universal manner of greeting. Funnily enough, in countries, that became Muslim converts. If I'm not mistaken, two Arab friends don't greet each other with salam. It perhaps has a more of a religious connotation. They say ahlan sahl, ahlan wa sahlan. Um, but in Iran, in many more new Muslim countries, we use salam 
for just a very quick way of greeting. So here I am, Salam. Now, can you read this? This is how I greeted you when I started this talk. Can you go right to the left? Should we have a go together? Nome man Narges ast. The verb right at the end. Nom. Do you recognize anything there? Can you spot the familiarity between these Persian words and the English word for? You're quite right. Name. What about man? Man. Me. I. Or my, for example. And ast. What about ast? What verb does that sound like? The German ist, is, ast. So what could this mean? The verb is at the end. But let's look at nome man. I'll give you a clue. It may not work forever. But for a short while, with the you know, elementary person, if you read the person from left to right, so if you like, you put a drop down menu, you read it from left to right, you get the English. Remember, you then put the verb in the right order because English is a subject verb object. You say, I saw my friend last weekend, while in Persian we will say, I, my friend, last weekend saw. So, nome man, can we read this from left to right? My name is Narges. What about the next bit? Nome famile man, farzad ast. What about this one? Let's put a drop down menu here. Drop just, you know, put the English underneath these words. Man, my, famil, family. Nom, name, my family name, my surname is Farzad. What's that little A doing there? When you listen to Iranian speak, you think, my goodness, so many of the words seem to end with a little A rhyming with cafe, for example. This little A is a vocal link that holds a noun like name or house or friend keeps it vocally linked to its possessor, like my name, nom me man, like an apostrophe, if you like, and to its other attributive characteristics, to an adjective, for example. So it's like saying name of mine, my name and my family name. Now I'm going to be a bit nosy and ask about you. Nome tu chi ast. To, again, in many languages, a second person, um, singular person, is a to or a thou or you. Persian, unlike English, but like very many languages, has a plural second person. Uh, so we can use that for really when I'm talking to, when I'm referring to you, which is more than you, one person, you, several person, or formal you, a very polite you. So chi, again, can you think of some European languages? Kie, chi, ki, question words for who or what. What am I asking you? Nome tu chi asked. What is your name? And note, my question word, my interrogative, it's gone where the answer should be. Unlike English, question words usually, in English, they usually start the um, a question word, don't you? Where were you? Who is that person? What color is um, this um, jumper, for example? But in Persian, it goes where the answer be. So you will say, I can say, Nome to, Melanie asked, Nome to, Philip asked, <clears throat> I can then use a pr polite plural uh, you. Nome shoma, she asked. That's how I would ask you. I wouldn't be so presumptuous to call you to just yet. You would remain the formal, uh, very respected shoma. Let's talk about nationalities a bit. Normally, you can add an e to the name of the country and you get 
the nationality, a little bit like IAN that you can add to a country, you know, America, American, um, you know, Australia, Australian, and so on, Iran, Iranian, in English. In Persian, we add an E. The names of these countries, if they happen to be part of our world and existence for a long time, they will have kept their name. So, you know, we have Mesr for Egypt. We're not going to use the word Egypt. But for newer countries, we've taken the French pronunciation of their name. So, for example, Germany in Iran would be Alman. So, but for our purpose, here we add an E to the name of the country and we get the nationality. So I'm going to tell you a little more about me. Can we read it together? And remember, I'm now just making these vowels, these short vowels going to disappear. Man, man, irani hastam. Man, irani hastam. Now, you remember that ast, which was is, well, that's for the third person verb ending. Now I'm saying I am. Look at another similarity. What if we start reading this from left to right? The doer of the verb, man, is always repeated at the end of the verb. Every Persian verb has a little ending who tells you who's done it. We can look at that a little later at another time. But here, if you read this, this has them. I am. Look, let's read, read this from left to right. I am Iranian. Now I'm going to remove these vowels and I'm just going to put a little, little diacritic there, a little sign there that you know that M in order to say man, I, has to be followed with a little a. Man, irony, has tam. And when I remove this, then you may get a bit of a shock, but hopefully by that stage, you will know what man is. You're not going to say mon or men. So you will remember this is man, irony, and you will have learned this word as hastam. The word hostum, for example, doesn't exist or hestem doesn't exist. And if you make a mistake and read it differently, well, an Iranian or a Persian speaker will say, for goodness sake, where did you learn your Persian? And they will correct you. This um, rarely happens. You will soon, soon get used to this. Let's move on. Let's do a little bit more reading. A European word is in there. Can you read this? I'll just give you a second or two. Remember, Farsi, Persian, Dari goes from right to left. Always remember that. So you need to read this odd as it is from right to left. Okay, let's read it. Long vowel O. Apartemone man. Apartemone man. Dar. Which city is this? London, Persian way of saying London. Apartment man, dar London ast. Let's go from left to right. My apartment. Dar is a preposition meaning in or at. My apartment is in London. And here I'm just going to remove these vowels there, which I've put them here in a, in a lowercase e. And I'm just going to give you a tiny little hint of it. So you know that the word is apartemon, not apartomon. This e stays because that's my vocal link, it's my apartment. Vocally needs to link to man. And here, can you read this one? A universally recognizable name. Alex Engelisi Ast. A British person, an English person, is known as someone from Engelistan. Alex Engelisi Ast. The Engelisi Anichi. What does that mean in English? Very good. Alex is English. And here I've just put a little marker 
and gradually those training markers will be removed and this will be Alex. Alex Ingelisi Asta. Let's expand our words. Let's look at this one again. Take a few seconds to read them. Right to left. And keep those long vowel R's really R, not an A, an R. Nome modare man Mariam ast. Time for another characteristic feature of Persian. Actually, it applies to Arabic too. There are no uh, um, uh, words in Persian that start with two consonants. In a minute, you'll see an example of how that can go wrong in Persian. We cannot say, uh, unless you know we've lived in a country for a long time and used that language for a long time, it's very hard for a Persian speaker or an Arabic speaker to say words that start with two solid letters. Say, for example, blue. You have the BL and an U to say, um, you know, brown or stop or street. That's three consonants. We have no problem with pronouncing these solid back-to-back -back consonants later on in the word. We have no problem saying empty, but a word like stop or smith or street is quite hard because we're used to having a vowel and then <clears throat> consonants or a consonant vowel consonant. So you might next time, if somebody's just arrived from Iran or an Arabic speaking country, you listen to them and they might say, you know, oh, Mr. Smith, I'm very pleased to see you because SM has to be split. Or I'll see you outside Russell Square tube station. Station in itself would be hard. It would become a station probably. Another feature of Persian, which Arabic doesn't have this problem, we do not have words with TH. So the is very hard for us. We have to really pause and focus and say, this is a TH, I must pronounce it as a the. Therefore, words, words that so many languages use, if it has a TH, in Persian, these become a D. Sometimes a T, but often a D. Armed with that, which relation am I talking about here? Should we read it one more time? Nome modare man Mariam asked. Let's go from left to right. Who is modar or pedar? Mother and father. The D really is the TH that you have in English. So my mother's name. And here that little a uh, link, the vocal link, really comes through as an apostrophe in English. My mum's name. What's her name? Mariam. Of course, it's the uh, biblical Virgin Mary, but also the name of a flower. What about this one? You might need to think about the word, not just in English, in German too. Take a second to look at this. Nome dochtare man setare ast. Dochtar, but that real ch, you really want to clear your throat ch. Does that sound like a German word for daughter? Sounds like close enough to the English as well. So what about this? My daughter's name. What is her name? Look at this little short vowels. If you ignore them, reading right to left, what is this? Absolutely, it's star. So my daughter's name is, not star, the English pronunciation, setare, where the word Tara comes from. Do you know? Any girls called Tara? Very popular name. And I believe you have Tara in Sanskrit as well. So Setare 
is split because the two consonants don't feature in Persian. I have a Z-Tore. Let's find out a little more about my mom. Modar man dar Tehran ast. Modar man dar Tehran ast. Do you remember what dar was? Apartman man dar London ast in or at. Where is my mom? Modar man dar Tehran ast. My mom is in Tehran, and here. I am removing the short vowels for a little while. I give you these diacritics and then I'll take them off completely. And here is Mo Dar, Mo Dar Man Dar Tehran Ast. I want to show you a bit of the script now. So, and I'm still going to write it in the Latin script going right to the left but time really for you to see the uh, real script too. So I was saying that really you read the Persian construction from left to right while you translate it in, into English and you get the right order and similarly you can read the English uh, you know, noun adjective, for example, noun possessor, from right to left, and you get the passion. So we have a little drop down menu, and you put the English word underneath. So here is nom, here nom, I'll put name underneath that. Here is my man, I'll write my underneath, and Farsi has rost bechat, Farsi from right to left, nom a man. Inglisi as chap berost from left to right, my name. Let's add a bit to this. And remember, we can't do th. Here we are. Can you have a go at this? Going from right to left. Nome barodare man. What's this one? My brother's name. My brother's name. Let's add another bit to this. And here we have nome, nome, duste hube man. My good friend's name. Nome, duste hube man. And you re realize, I hope, that all this word nom. Dust, hope, they're all mine. My friend is mine. My good friend is mine. So the name of my good friend is like the apostrophe. So almost every word sounds like it's ending with an A like cafe. Let's take a break again and get ready for episode three, when we will look at some of the characteristics of the Persian language and see whether I can make it just a little bit easier for you in order to take the first steps in reading Persian. Take care. Bye for now.